let's get started. So today's webinar, as I've already said, combining your analytics with automation to win the war for talent. It's a hot topic. We've got a lot of information we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be keeping it high level. We're not going to be going into product live at all. This is going to be more of a, let's think of a thought leadership conversation that myself and Joe are going to be having. We've known each other a long time. We'll get into introductions now, but uh, we've got a lot to say about this. So hope, hopefully you'll enjoy it. Myself, I'm Ben Carter. I'm the Sales and Strategy Director for Automation here at Bullhorn. Uh, I've been in the industry, I was talking to Joe about this earlier, 19 years I checked over this month. So I've been around for a long time in this industry. It's come a long way in terms of technology. Um, I was a customer of Bullhorns twice in a previous life. I've been at Bullhorn for just over four years now. My role is to work internally with all internal stakeholders to make sure that our automation products that we can solve for you as a business, uh, as an organization, align and work perfectly for what you need. So looking forward to talking about automation today, but I'll let Joe introduce himself. But yeah, today I'm, today I'm also joined by Joe. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, so Joe McGuire, Sales and Strategy Director for Analytics at Bullhorn. Uh, my career didn't start as long ago in the industry as Ben. It was only 17 years, which is why my beard's a little less grey. Um, I was a, a recruiter for a couple of years, like I say, and uh, moved over to Broadbeam, where I spent five years through some of the fastest growth of that business. And I was there right through the acquisition by DMGT, stayed on for another couple of years after that. Uh, Ten years ago, we set up Cube19, where I was the chief revenue officer. Uh, and the goal there was really to help staffing companies uh, maximise the value of their data. And for anyone that uh, didn't see the press recently, uh, Cube19 was acquired by Bullhorn back in November. We were one of the um, sort of core marketplace partners for many, many years. Um, but the most common question I was asked actually after the acquisition wasn't why, why did Bullhorn acquire Cube? It was more why now? And I think this next slide really, um, really tells a bit of the story. So this is from the Bullhorn Grid survey, which we'll reference a little bit today. Um, most companies now are using data to inform decisions which is great. I'm a little disappointed it's not 100%, but it's a, it's a pretty high number. What really stands out to me is that half of the companies that are using that data don't trust it. And a big part of that reason is that very few companies are actually automating their processes today. So Bullhorn's always heavily invested in analytics for our customers. Uh, ben, if you flip on a slide. Um, and the, the portfolio, the Bullhorn Analytics portfolio pre-Cube 19 was this. So data mirror to extract data out, to enterprise analytics software, and Canvas to make data readily available for people in, a, in any staffing business. Now, these systems help solve a very specific use case. You have skilled people in your business that are delivering high level business data to leadership. And this is really important. So leadership can have a finger on the pulse of the health of the business, but that leaves a very large part of the company underserviced by data. That, that means they have an over-reliance on spreadsheets or asking others in the business for information when they need it. And this is really where Cube19 comes in. We designed the platform to deliver self-serve insights that drive productivity and return on effort at the desk level. So these platforms are very much complementary to each other. And it's a sort of complete analytics portfolio now. But everyone is here today to talk about the challenges that we're all facing in the market, which is ultimately the talent shortage. Um, now, this isn't a single industry or region that's experiencing this challenge. It's every industry in every region. And this is an issue that's holding companies back. It's slowing down their growth. Businesses need more people to achieve their objectives. And unsurprisingly, if we look at, uh, again, more data from the Bull Grid survey, uh, for the first time ever, now this has never made it to the top of the table before, but for the first time ever, um, the talent shortage was the, the number one challenge. And by no shock then, the top priority for 2022 is candidate acquisition. So this type of market is really where our industry thrives, but we still need to find innovative ways to overcome the challenge. So let's talk about the myth a moment. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to kind of debunk this myth slightly as we go through this, but the myth to us is how do we find more candidates? And what that really means is we need to go out there, acquire more candidates, spend more money on external sources to make sure that we can get those candidates in. That's great. And there's, there's a huge use case for that. And we always understand the value of job boards and search capabilities out there in order to do that. But we're going to challenge you today and we're going to say, how do we look within? So how do we better utilize the candidates that we already know that are already in Bullhorn? You've already paid to acquire them once. And this is where we're going to start to focus more today around what we're going to call uh, what, sorry, what, what, what we're going to focus on today when we start to get deep into the topic. Uh, what I just want to quickly touch on is 
Bullhorn, Bullhorn's focus as a whole has shifted along with the industry now as well. And we really want to lead the charge and help you meet the moment where it comes to the way that you digitally transform your business. So we've had a lot of customers on this journey for a while now. They've been going through digital transformation. All of the customers that come onto the Bullhorn ecosystem are always going through that digital transformation in order to move their ATS or their database to the cloud, make it a single source of truth. And that's the Bullhorn platform at the bottom here. So they're really digitizing their core their core cent central source of truth. Then we, in the last couple of years, we've really seen this growth in automation in the industry. Uh, th this is funny enough part of what I do at Bullhorn. So I live and breathe this, this step all the, along the way, but automation truly is a game changer now in where you can really unlock lots of capabilities within your organization. So whether that be freeing up time, creating better experiences, or whether that be actually doing more with less. So not having to maybe invest in as much in terms of people and doing more through through automation through the platform as well and to really be able to create a incredible candidate experience or talent experience you can only really do that on scale so that's where automation really comes in talent experience as a whole this is something we're not really going to be covering today we have elements of it from creating a good experience but the talent experience part of this is going to be for a future session where there's lots to talk about that as a business coming down in the future. Today, we're going to be focusing more around automation. So we've got things like bullhorn automation, product that I live and breathe, where um, people can do a lot. And Cube19 is automation as well. Not a lot of people think that, but this is automating information to the desk for everyone to be able to use and make data-driven decisions on a daily basis. So what everything we'll be talking about today really does have a flavor of automation. Um, just, just so you know, we're seeing that trend as well. So this grid survey that we do every year, uh, grid.bullhorn.com for anyone that wants to go and see these stats live on the website. Um, two years ago, only 25% of businesses were actually focusing on digital transformation. We've seen a 3X in that in two years. So this means that the industry is shifting. This is table stakes now where people need to actually start to create a better experience for everybody and start to really make sure that, uh, trans that transforming their business is the only way to stay ahead. Last thing I want to talk about quickly is the Bullhorn platform. This has evolved a lot over the last couple of years. Yes, we've been making acquisitions. Joe is a perfect example of where, where when opportunity and, um, and preparation comes together, when the market's ready, we can make those acquisitions and we can really make sure that all of our customers can take advantage of that. Our, pla our platform really does break down into a few sections. For the majority of people on this call, those that are already on Bullhorn, for any, any prospects that we have out there that are currently looking at Bullhorn, Sales and recruitment is really where the majority of our customers were a couple of years ago. So they were just using the front office ATS CRM. So that means that they are digitizing their platform and they're utilizing the sales and recruitment part of it. Candidate experience is something that we've had capabilities for for many years. Uh, candidate onboarding capabilities, uh, being able to make sure that um, that we can communicate clearly with people. All of this is creating that candidate experience. And this could be a core focus for us to in, in, in the coming months to really talk about this more as a business. Um, and, this, and then we've got the Marketplace Partnership uh, Program. So that's where the Bullhorn Marketplace can really start to plug, fill the gap, really, and really start to enhance your experience on Bullhorn with certain niches or requirements that you may have where there's other technology vendors out there that can do that. Then we've got automation and reporting and analytics. These really wrap around the core platform. So from an automation perspective, it's about what you can do from front to back in your processes, making sure that anything happening in the front office can, can, can have the right knock-on effect when you start to work your way through, backwards through your organization. And reporting and analytics is really about making sure and ensuring that this data is available for you top to bottom in your organization as well. So what Joe spoke about earlier about there's certain top level reporting capabilities and then there's desk level reporting capabilities. We really see that all the way across there. So today's topic, um, Joe, I can just quickly take it. Sorry, I've already said it. So today's topic, how to win the war for talent. Yeah, I think there's, there's two uh, sides to this problem really. Um, there's recruiters finding candidates for their clients. But there's also everyone on this call is probably experiencing the same issue, trying to trying to find your own talent internally. So some of the ideas we're going to share today cover both sides of that. We are looking at very specific examples here. Um, so please just uh, broaden your mind a little bit and think that this does cover the whole sales and recruiting processes. Um, and, and again, it's about making sure that um, we're helping you utilize the candidates you better have today but also making sure that, that we take help take pressure off of you to always have to add new heads to keep growing at the same rate you've always grown. If you can get more productivity per head, again, it relieves that pressure. So 
Uh, sourcing new candidates is always going to be necessary, um, but you already know a lot of candidates. So uh, it's about engaging better with the talent you have that you already know. It's about maximizing your chance of placing those known candidates when you're working with them. And it's about redeploying and re-redeploying more and more candidates that you've already placed previously. Because little tip, it's a lot easier to redeploy someone than it is to place a net new candidate. Perfect. Ben, do you want to take over? Yeah, so first of all, I'm going to just talk about Engage. So I've got a metric for you that I'm going to bring up, a stat that I'm going to bring up on screen. Um, we're not going to talk about the, the number first. We're going to talk about the, the, the problem itself. So candidates on your database are, cons are constantly out of date if you are not automating your engagement. Think about that for a moment. Just think about that in your head. What are you doing today to make sure that you can, com can consistently communicate with your entire database? It's probably hard, right? If you've been around for a little while as an organization, think about the number of recruiters or consultants that you have in your business. Think about the volume of your database that you have at the moment as well. And then start to think, what's the level of effort to truly be able to continually engage with all of those candidates when that target is, is continually moving? Because as time goes on, those candidates will start to become out of date again. So this is really where we feel automation is required. 81%, up to 81% of your database can be out of date at any one time if you think about, say, a 12-month period. So it's going to be super hard in order to, for everyone to do five times the amount of effort to make sure that that database is, is continually communicated with. But this is really where automation comes in. So I'm going to take us through a scenario where we've got a database. We, we've got a few scenarios here. So Number one, candidates that are older than 12 months that have not been spoken to in a, in a, in a allotted amount of time. There's been no activity with them. Uh, the recruiters have stopped searching them. They're, they're starting to look elsewhere because they just see that the CV's old and on, on mass, there's no way they're gonna be able to reach out to them all and ask them for a new CV. So let's think, we, will, we can template these emails going out, right? So this is one scenario, a one-to-one, a -one, Joe is messaging someone directly from the system. It's actually automated. There's no, Joe's not actually doing anything here. This is just happening in the background, but that message can go out. So that recruiter is outreaching to that candidate directly. And there's a call to action. Click here and our online system can capture all of this information. Make it sound nice and simple for them to do. Well, if candidate ownership isn't a thing, or if that recruiter's now left the business and now that candidate is disconnected in any way, well, you can reach out from a branded level, from an organization level as well. Big, clear call to action. Please update your information. I'm going to get to how they do that in a moment. Don't worry, so we can start thinking about that. This could also be text messaging. So this could be a one-to-one -one relationship text message. This could be a text message again, just coming generically from the organization. But it's been a while since we last spoke. From reviewing your profile, I can see it's out of date, but we've got some great roles for you. Click this call to action and book time in my diary or click this call to action and, and, and start to provide us an update of your profile. So what happens? Well, the person clicks that link. First and foremost, they're taken to your website. It's your brand. This isn't a third party technology or a third party URL. And they're going to start to fill out this information. So there's, there's some instructions here. Click next to continue. So the first thing we're going to ask them is, hey, Charlie, we already know some of this information about you because you're already on our database. We've got you listed as a Java developer. Please choose your current skills. And they can pick and choose from any of this, from any of this information. You're, you're completely setting up this information as you go. Next up, what's your availability date? Well, those skills that they've just selected are going to make their way back and auto skill the candidate. And this availability date can do exactly the same thing. So now as they provide that new date of when they're available, if they're a contractor or maybe they're permanent, and you know what, it's going to be a three month notice period. So I'll put three months out as a potential available date. Well, that information is now going to make its way back to the candidate record as well. Uh, in this current climate, so let's think about some more topical questions. In this current climate, uh, which work location would you prefer? Are, are you strictly going to say you only want to work remotely? Are you happy to be in the office? Are you happy to hybrid? Whatever that answer is, that's information that the, that the recruiter can now actually take action on. And last and certainly not least is actually they can upload a copy of their latest CV. So not only are we now asking questions that are flowing back to Bullhorn automatically, we can now capture that CV that gets pushed back into the parser. And now the parser can go and enrich wider into that candidate record as well. So we now know their availability date. We know what skills that they, they say they have. We know what their work preference is, and now we've got an up-to-date CV in that system. So now when we're searching in Bullhorn, well, that's good because we've got now an enriched database where all these candidates are now up-to-date with fresh CVs that we can start to review. But it's not just that because once that survey's finished, well, when the, when the candidate closes it, 
you can leave them straight on that job page. So if they're a Java developer and it's a Java developer focused survey, well, leave them on your Java developer job page. So not only have you asked them just to provide some new information, if they've done that, chances are they're a warm candidate and they're showing signs of wanting to move or get a new job. So leave them on a place where they can start to apply for these roles as well. So just to wrap up, we can auto outreach to dormant records on the database. We can auto update these records with the information that's captured and we can auto enrich the candidate database with the data that's with the with up to date information. Let's talk about maximize. Yeah, so let's look at let's look at another stat then. So what percentage of candidates have their CV or resume sent to a client that that agency does not place? The number's 89%. Now think about that for a moment. 89% of candidates that were good enough for you to submit their CV or resume, did you, you didn't place, which is an astronomically high number. And is it something you even measure? Do you look at this? I would hazard a guess that a significant majority, hopefully everyone, is looking at job fill rate. But we're in a candidate short market right now. So is it not more important to be looking at candidate placement rate instead? Maybe looking at both all the time would be a sensible thing to do. And that might indicate market shifts and so on. 11% um, is the average candidate placement rate. I mean, that, that shocks me. Every time I look at this stat, it shocks me. But it also excites me because there's a huge opportunity out there with the candidates you already know that you're already working with. So let's look at uh, one of the reasons behind this. And this isn't the reason, it's one of the reasons. But the, the next stat is um, what percentage of candidates that got to interview stage were sent to another job or contact? So another job we had or speculatively sent out for business uh, development reasons. 69% were not sent to another job. So this is a candidate that in a candidate short market, someone deemed good enough to interview which I'm guessing that, you know, if one hiring manager wanted to interview, I'm certain there's others out there. But most of the time recruiters get to that, that candidate to interview and move on to the next candidate. And this is a really common trait in a job short market because it's much more about getting coverage on, on lots of jobs. Whereas right now there's loads of jobs out there, very few candidates and making sure we give ourselves the best opportunity to, to place those candidates that we already know or our competition will. Candidates have a lot of choice at the moment. And your team should be jumping on this, not just individuals, your team should be aware of these candidates as well. So they can uh, jump on that opportunity and make sure they're getting this candidate in front of as many of the relevant people as possible. But how do you improve this? You know, it's, it's all well and good talking about the stats, but there needs to be a mechanism in place to make sure that these things are improved. Companies wanna achieve scalable growth. There's no question of that. At Cube19, we actually talk about highly scalable growth. And this is where you grow your revenue faster than your costs while having a positive impact on the client, candidate, and colleague experience. Uh, but if you just flip on a side, recruiting's a tough gig. So how can you make the life of a recruiter or sales rep easier and more fulfilling? Well, the industry still relies too heavily, in my opinion, on purely volume-based metrics, metrics that are looking backwards. How much more productive would your people be if they had forward-looking metrics? Actionable insights, we call them. So metrics that show what actions to take today to be more successful tomorrow. Now we're lucky to work in a highly motivated industry um, and actionable insights can actually massively help improve the return on effort that people are already putting in. If you just sort of hone in on maybe the top two on here, just as a quick example, top right, first of all. So you've got starters coming up that haven't been contacted recently. Again, in a candidate short market where just because you've got them, you've had an offer accepted by a candidate, they're still getting offers elsewhere. So keeping in regular contact with those candidates is really important. But this here starts to remind everyone at the desk that they've got to do these things. There's a lot for them to remember every day. Um, the, the one at the top left is actually directly related to the, to the stat earlier. So how many of, of the candidates that we've got to interview, how many haven't been sent elsewhere? Again, it's about making sure this information is shared with the right people so they can take action on it. But again, it's impossible to remember every task and action you have to take. So auto-generated lists that are put in front of the recruiter in real time within Bullhorn is really the mechanism for improving those stats.
<clears throat> so to wrap up on there, step one is to automate the reporting process. Um, it's a laborious task if you don't, and it means you just by default end up with out of date data. But it's that, that real time data delivered to the business, business sorry, and individualizing those dashboards with actionable insights. So each persona and job role in your business is only looking at the relevant data and information that helps them be more productive in their job and, and increase return on effort. So we're going to the, the third and final stat here, redeployment. So if you do direct hire then permanent, there's some other stats we can look at with you, but I believe there's gonna be a significant majority of people on this call that do contract or temp recruitment. So how many contract finishes are redeployed into their next role by the same agency or firm that had them in their previous role? Uh, I don't know which way around I said that. How many, how many are not redeployed? Is the appointment going after here? So the, the answer is 60%. 60% of contractors that were on assignment were not placed into their next job by the agency that had them in their last, which is a worrying enough stat. Because if you think about all of the energy and effort and cost that goes into placing that candidate the first time, you know, in terms of the, the recruiting process, building the relationship, uh, compliance, payrolling, all of that effort that goes in and more, to then not redeploy them, when actually redeployment is, is the easier part, you've already got the relationship and you even have the reference from the previous hiring manager. But more worryingly than this stat, half of the candidates that you did not, or that, don't, that don't get redeployed, were never even contacted by that agency about their next role. And again, I, I think this sort of stems from, um, you know, this hardwired motivation we have in us in, in this industry where we've got to keep hunting for more and new stuff. And actually, a lot of the, the basics can be forgotten as well. Also, this data is very hard to come by. It's not like you can just click your fingers in it and it, it comes up, uh, unless you're using Q19, of course. But think about some of the data and metrics that would sit behind this. So tracking your entire process, looking at your baseline numbers, so you know where your starting point is and where you're looking to improve from. So things like who are your finishers coming up? How many of those have been extended? How many have been redeployed? But then looking at what's the risk here? Which ones haven't been extended or redeployed? Which ones are, you know, are gonna potentially be? Um, but then taking those and, and onto the next step of what is the actionable insight that sits behind it that should live on the recruiter's dashboard? It's the finishers that haven't had the relevant activities required to redeploy them. And putting it into monetary terms as well, will start to drive action um, in the sense of this example here, we're about to lose 13 and a half K of weekly gross margin that we haven't attempted to retain. So it's then about, again, how does this ratio, what's our baseline numbers and having access to that information right away, but then looking at how this trends over time. And again, making sure this is easily and readily available real-time data. Otherwise it just, it gets forgotten about. It gets moved to the side because it takes too long. But this is also an example of where automation can further assist with uh, engaging with the candidates in the background and supporting the actions that humans are taking. Yeah, perfect, Joe. Thanks. Um, so let's talk about it for a moment. Bullhorn automation, for those of you that are not using it or just not aware of what it is, um, fundamentally, there's a lot of blueprints that come out the box. These blueprints are industry best standard um, automations that we feel all of our customers should be running. And we actually challenge you all to use as many of these blueprints as possible because it will just improve your processes out of the box. Uh, you deploy these in minutes, you can turn them on immediately, you can start to get traction from them immediately. Um, but you can also customize them. They're not hard coded. Just think of them as templates that you can put into your system. Now, funny enough, one of the most popular blueprints that we do have on here and one that a lot of our customers talk about is the redeployment process. And that's because we're not saying that we should only be automating the redeployment process. But again, automation, you're probably seeing a trend here. It helps with the human element of recruitment as we go. So we just take an example of redeploying candidates via email as a, as a communication method. Well, before the event of the end date taking place, we will identify if, if a candidate is going to extend or not. And if the candidate is not going to extend, then we can start to trigger automations like this. So again, we're not saying that a recruiter should not be reaching out to somebody, but as Joe said, 60% of them are not actually replacing them and half of those are not even putting them through for another job. So something's wrong. So automation can really fill this gap and make sure that, that this is the net that catches those that are slipping. So in this case, we've got four weeks before the end date is happening. We're going to send a communication out 
And then again, we're also going to we're also going to send an internal notification so the placement owner also knows the automation is happening. These aren't going to run in, in separate silos. This is going to work together with humans and systems. Uh, then again, two weeks before, we're going to send another notification just to warn them, hey, two weeks are away, but we're also going to make sure we've got coverage on those candidates. So we'll be sending communications out. And what is a redeployment communication? What, what, what does it really contain? Well, it can contain anything you want it to. It can be a transactional communication, which is where automation running is running at its best. Um, I will always get a notification of my upcoming dentist appointment or when I'm now due for my next appointment. Well, why wouldn't you message a, a, a candidate of yours or a worker of yours to say, hey, four weeks, you're about to finish. Let's make sure that you now start to see the jobs that are available to you so we can get you straight back into that work process again. More importantly, it's about making sure that your brand is in front of them before your competition. These candidates must be going somewhere else. So the competition are talking to them at the moment. So what's going to be easier for the candidate? Is it going to be the incredible experience they've had with yourself? They've been communicated to all the way through the process because you have automation. So therefore, nothing ever slips the net. Is it going to be the person that they've already onboarded with? So it's going to be simpler when it comes to providing documentation, making sure that starting on day one is going to be going to be actually low hanging fruit for them because it's going to be a much easier process. Or are they going to go and restart this entire process with an agency that maybe they've never worked with before? Maybe one that potentially they're not going to get as good an experience with. So having communications that look like this, this is just an email that's gone out again, whether it's from the placement owner, whether it's from your business, it doesn't matter. We've got capabilities for everything. But what we're saying here is let's find you your next your next role before you even finish the one you're currently on. So we know that your placement's coming to an end. We've got AI matching technology in our organization that has identified these three jobs as now the best three jobs for you to go take a look at on our website. Click on them, take any action you want, apply for these roles as we go. But also feel free to book time in my diary at any time. So if this was coming from an individual, they could just click book time in that recruiter's diary. We know that it may be that, yeah, do you know what? The candidate does want to speak to them three weeks before this placement finishes because I've just seen a role I'm really interested in or simply just replying into the email could trigger this off. This can also be text message as well. This again, this isn't this is restricted in one way or another. But what we are talking about is this is how we can utilize automation to really help turbocharge your redeployment stats and your rates to make sure that if a candidate is not redeploying with you, there's got to be other fundamental issues that are going on there. And, and that's something else that you can also track in as a business. Um, so just to wrap up this one, it's all about understanding your real time baseline numbers. So where I, if I'm sitting at desk and I'm a recruiter, where what's what's the health of my contractor book at the moment? Let's make sure I'm on top of it and make sure I can always see what's happening within all, all of this. And more importantly, how they're trending. Uh, it's about delivering tailored, actionable insights to maximize the opportunity. So all of these actionable insights are available out the box. You can start to review them immediately when you're utilizing Cube19 as your analytics platform. And again, whether that's you're an individual or you're a team leader or you're a leader in the business, being able to see this at any level of your organization to make sure that you're not missing these opportunities for redeployment. And thirdly, it's about leveraging that automation opportunity, uh, leveraging automation to ensure that candidates are driven back to you before they even finish. Yeah, so just to, to wrap up here, the, the industry is experiencing an unprecedented challenge right now. <clears throat> there's, but there's a huge amount of missed opportunity. So we want everyone to just you know, think about this, just engage, maximize, and redeploy the candidates you already know. Um, because when we think about those earlier questions, the obvious question isn't always the right question. So uh, we'll open up to, to questions in just a moment, but please take this away and, and just ask yourself and your colleagues in your business, how do you better utilize the candidates you already know within your company? And that is our, mine and Ben's honest belief that this is the best way to win the war for talent. Yep. So with that, um, we've seen a few questions come in. I'm about to sort through them. But just to remind everyone on the call, please do ask away, ask questions in the Q&A panel. We'll try and answer as many as we can. Uh, any commercial questions, if you're thinking about asking about any pricing or anything like that, just to get ahead of the questions that we've already seen come in, just reach out to your account manager or your known sales rep and they'll be able to have that conversation with you. That's not something we're going to be talking about today on the webinar. Um, but yeah, just going through some of these. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, just another question coming in. So yeah, just to reiterate, uh, for, for, to get in any of these features, please do just speak to your account manager about costs, etc. Um, 
Spencer, yeah, you may have missed the very start of the um, the very start of the webinar, but you'll be getting a copy of this webinar. There'll be a follow up with an email from the marketing department, so they'll share a recording of this for you, so that you can definitely review it. Um, I've got an interesting one here, Joe, and I'm really I'm really keen to get your eyes on it. So, how do you recommend using your current candidates to gain more placements over time? How does referrals fact, uh, factor into this? That's probably two separate questions, right? Yeah. So, sorry, current current candidates to make more placements over time. Yeah. yeah. And and then the source one as well. No, I, I think I'll just refer back to to the earlier um, stats within there. Getting a candidate to an interview it is not. The process complete you've got to get through that the uh, sorry through to, to that uh, placement point or offer point but they're getting lots and lots of interest from other agencies and they're probably applying for jobs directly right now as well because there's, there's so much choice out there so what i would say is by utilizing that data working more closely with your candidates i think every uh, recruiter i talk to you know is, is, a, is a trusted partner to their clients and candidates but utilizing the data to, to really build on that relationship and as you start to do this over time Look at the candidates uh, historically that you got two, three or four interviews with. What was your fill rate with those candidates? You know, and you'll see it's almost certainly significantly higher, not just a little bit higher, significantly higher. Look at that. Use that information and, and data point to talk to your candidates as well and say, if you work with us, we will get you out in front of the right people. We, we you know, will get you your job. So I would leverage data to give confidence uh, to the people you're talking to. Same goes for your clients as well. You know, why should they work with you? Because you're using this data uh, to, to inform best practice. Uh, on to the, the second part of that question, source. I mean, candidate source, I used to work at Broadbean. It was what I talked about every day back then. Um, candidate source is really important, um, but not just looking at necessarily how much money you make from each source. You know, is referrals better or worse than, than you know, one of the job boards? Your data will tell you that. But don't just look at how many candidates we generated from a source and how much money we made. Look at the energy and effort that goes in in between those points as well. You know, if you're um, if you're getting loads and loads of candidates from a source and you're sending them everywhere and getting them interviews and you're never making uh, the, the right proportionate revenue from it, you're actually wasting a lot of time and energy from that source as well as making money. So it's about looking at the, the whole picture and, and weighing up the, um, the value of that source in its in its uh, in its entirety. Uh, perfect. So I've got another one here on the cube topic from Spencer, which is what reports would you suggest to have on the dashboard as a good rule of thumb? Uh, challenging on that because um, yeah. we talk about individualized dashboards. So without knowing yeah. your business, <laughs> the markets you service, what your challenges are right now, I can't give a specific one. But the, the metrics that I would always come back to are actionable insights. You know, telling, telling someone, you know, how many things they did earlier today, yesterday, last week. Um, a volume-based metric is, is can be misleading because someone could be doing lots and lots of something and not getting much of the actual positive outcome we want. So I would always encourage to look at the actions that haven't yet taken place rather than what did take place because we can't change that. But the actions today can influence how successful we are tomorrow. So the category of metric, if I was to sum it up, would be to look at those actionable insights alongside that data as well, but you'll get more value from that. Yeah. And there's a great follow-up question as well. So also working with a team that is not as analytical as myself, any suggestions on how we get buy-in? Yeah, again, it's um, it's a great question and great you're thinking like that as well. Um, I'm an ex-recruiter. Uh, Dan, you know, uh, the, the CEO of Cube9 team before the acquisition is an ex-recruiter. And we, loads of our mates work in the industry. We spent most of our adult lives in the industry. So we, we think like recruiters, we're salespeople and recruiters, we're not analysts, we're not developers. So when we set out to, to deliver this information to the desk, we knew our biggest challenge was how do we put it in, in a format and a way that non-technical salespeople can actually understand it and turn it, turn it into productivity. So we've designed this platform for exactly the, the use case you're talking about, that how do you engage people? And be realistic with yourself, be honest. You, it's not a magic wand. You don't put data into uh, in front of someone in Bullhorn and all of a sudden they start in, like, using it and getting loads of value. Some people will, but you have to work with them. You have to help them understand why it's there. And more importantly, what, what's in it for them? What's the value to them of using the data? Um, and that's really it. I think, think about it as a journey. We talk about the data journey all the time. You can't complete it at the start. You probably never complete it. It's an ongoing journey. But taking it in stages, making sure like with any um, technology adoption, 
making sure you get your early adopters, the, the forward thinking people, the people that get it, use those as your reference and test cases, and then expand out um, adoption across the rest of the business. Yeah, great one. Um, I'll, I'll take this one, Joe. So this one sounds a bit more for automation. So what's the best game plan for data cleanup prior to candidate communication and automation? Uh, probably, actually, this probably relates to both of us, right? Because healthy data is at the core of everything if you want to really be able to analyze to your best or to be able to automate to your best. Um, well, actually, before, so you say before automation, I say immediately after automation, the first thing you should be doing with, with Bullhorn Automation is actually going through a program of cleansing your data. So what Bullhorn Automation is not just around communication. There's actually three elements to it. There's productivity, so how it can make your business more productive. That's making sure that things like tasks are set, into, are set in Bullhorn automatically so that the recruiter or the consultant know exactly what to do at the right time. But it's also about just data automation. So every time an action takes place in the system, the output of that could be changing fields of values or data. So what you saw in the example today is how we can reach out to candidates and have them actually provide us new data. So that's that's improving the data or the quality of the data that we have. But simple things, and I mean basic simple things like when a placement finishes, are you changing the status of the placement so you know it completed versus early terminated? Um, are you closing out the job properly to make sure that that job we had from the client was a successful outcome that got to completion? Are you are you managing the statuses of your candidates? So at any point of any journey, whether that be pre-hire, through the recruitment process, or during placement, or even post-hire, their status is correct. So when people are searching the database, they know where a candidate is at the moment and whether they should be reaching out to them or not. Think about it from your customer side as well. So if you think about sales, are you really segmenting out your contacts based on activity? So those that are engaging with you in, in terms of providing opportunities of jobs and you're working those or ones where you've got paying customers versus those where it's very much a one way conversation at the moment. I'm just continually talking to prospects, but I'm not getting much back from them. Well, you can automate all of those as well, just to make sure that that data health is as clean as it can be. Then automation, then, uh, then the more strategic and the more complex automations can definitely come off the back of that. But Joe, I'd probably say the same for Cube19, right? It's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an analogy here of rubbish in, rubbish out. It's kind of the, it's always been that analogy when it comes to using a system, but you can only analyze on the data you've got. Is there any key things that you, you would suggest that people concentrate on to, in order to maximize their analytics? Yeah, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. I, th I think technology adoption in this industry is always a challenge, no matter what it is. Um, but data analytics is no different to that. And actually, if people don't understand what it is, what it is or what the value is, why will they use it? So um, we actually identified uh, lack of CRM adoption as one of the biggest risks for Cube19 in the early days. You know, if people don't put the data in, what's the point in having analytics over it? So we had two options. We either try and avoid the conversation or we try and help solve the problem. And we opted for the for the latter. So what we always talk about at Cube is like, I think there's four key areas that that um, help ensure you get great adoption of, of you know your CRM and, and your analytics as well from a from a user perspective. Step one is engaging the end user in their own real time data and you know, making it very relevant to them. Step two is to be able to track what they're not doing, where they're skipping process and things, so you can train them because we can't expect everyone to know how to do everything after a training session or a couple of training sessions. It's a continuous thing. So tracking where the errors are so you can um, train and also automate. Um, the third step is what's in it for them, as I mentioned earlier. And those actionable insights are really what's in it for people. It shows them how to be more productive and get a better return on the effort they're already putting in. And that's one of the key things that will really engage people. The final thing from a Q perspective is gamify it. Make it fun, make it enjoyable. We work in a competitive environment, you know, and, and we want healthy competition throughout the business. So having uh, deal flashes and leaderboards and trends and incentives up on your TVs around the office is a really important part as well. But it sort of ties into another question I saw actually, Ben. Would Cube19 replace the need for Hearfish? I think quite the opposite. Data will help inform the automations you can have um, to make sure that you get, you get through the process and... Uh, uh, recording the data in as clean a way as possible but also there's a limited amount of resource like humans can only do a certain number of, of things every day yeah. so supporting those with automation is so important the lower value higher volume tasks that you have to do lots of to get some return that's where automation plays but those two things for me sit hand in hand yeah totally agree um yeah 
they're very different in what they do. You can have some very similar outcomes, but there is very different methods in order to do it. But fundamentally, one does not replace the other. To hand in hand is where you see the value that we presented today. Um, another one, so I, I can probably take this one from an automation perspective, but how can you tell that your current database is up to date? What is the easiest and quickest way to update this? Um, I'm gonna do the first part of that question very much a, a few things to look for in terms of if you're going to start to silo out your database in terms of age, look for activity. So if there's no placements, no CV sends, no interviews, no shortlists, that candidate's not been used recently. So therefore, or, or within a time frame, then that candidate's not been used recently. Look for the notes activity that's happening on there as well. As a business, you should really be best practice leaving notes on all your candidates all the way through the process. It's the only way you can truly track what engagement is happening in your business with these candidates or what activity is taking place. So from based on note types or, or note dates, you, you can also start to tell what part of your database is out to date, uh, out of date there as well. Or it could be any other any other kind of metric that you may have, any field any field changes that, that will trigger this as well that you can do for you through your reporting. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. And in terms of the quickest and easiest way to update this, I think I hit that on the last one around the data automations that you should be thinking about first just to make sure that your database is clean. Couple of minutes left. Uh, we've got quite a few in here still. Just make sure that we can hit a couple of them. And just to uh, add a bit from a Q perspective on that, um, make sure the database is up to date. Um, it comes back to that sort of point too of tracking what's not being done. And some of the common areas, you know, people leave jobs open. They, they haven't filled the job, they just leave it open in Bullhorn. So, you know, you'll get a, a, a made up number of how many jobs you've actually got because they're not really live. So tracking those types of things. But also looking at, at leading indicators of, of poor data quality. So it's really common that with perm jobs, uh, someone does all the work outside the, the CRM or the ATS, and then they add the job and the, the placement right at the end of the process. So looking at where your time to fill on jobs is really short, much shorter than you'd expect for that type of role. And it probably means they're not adding all of the CVs, all of the interviews as well. So you can really start to surface those leading indicators at the same time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with one last question. It's one of the most recent ones that come in, but it's, it's Grab my attention. This webinar was specific to candidates. Is there a way to use the dashboards for client or contacts, or is that for a different webinar? Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's definitely not a one minute answer, yeah. uh, a one minute demonstration or, or conversation, but absolutely. Um, my view is that a staffing and recruiting company has four key assets. You've got your, you know, your, your producers, your sales uh, people, your recruiters, your consultants. You've then got the clients that they're servicing. Then the candidates there, sorry, the jobs they're trying to fill for those clients and the candidates they're trying to fill them with. Those things are all fully interconnected. You should be able to answer a question about any of those things in real time to get the answer to the new question you've just asked. So short answer, yes, uh, you can absolutely use it for that. Yeah, and with that, we're at time. There's only a couple more here. We're gonna make sure that your, your questions get answered for sure. There's no problem with that. We're tracking all these questions in the system. Uh, Joe, after what? 16 years of knowing each other. Thank you so much for being on the webinar with me for the first time. And, and it's, it's, it's really good to call your colleague as well. For anyone that has any further questions, if you feel like you want to talk to either of us individually a bit more, our email address is on screen. Feel free to drop us an email and we'll, we'll either have a chat or we'll route you to the right people in the business to have a conversation as well. But with that, we're at time.